said, I'm a professor in computer science uh, in, at the Aalto University. Uh, that used to be uh, the former Helsinki University of Technology. Uh, I'm saying this because most people don't uh, know what Aalto University is, uh, but uh, it is actually uh, the oldest and biggest technical university in, uh, in Finland. Uh. Now, <coughs> Mariano here said, uh, he mentioned that this uh, IT guy who usually uh, sits uh, in the corner and say speaking something uh, strange that nobody else understands, uh, uh, to be honest, uh, I sort of tend to be a little bit uh, that uh, kind of, uh, of a guy, so uh, my presentation will probably be quite a bit uh, more technical than the others, uh, but uh, there will you will also see demos of real systems and the business uh, behind those systems. Okay, <coughs> summary of my presentation is uh, that, uh, or the logic of it is that I'll first go through the history of the Internet of Things a little bit, uh, uh, then uh, explain why we are speaking about systems of systems uh, there and not just about Internet of Things in the context of the Open Platform 3. Uh, then we'll have a look at the standards landscape and what we are doing there. Uh, a, a quick look at security in the Internet of Things. And uh, then I'll show some uh, real applications uh, that uh, really illustrate what, uh, what this whole thing is about. And then conclusions. So, uh <coughs> Okay, the Internet of Things, uh, I sort of uh, like presenting uh, this slide uh, because uh, it seems like uh, not that many people actually know about the history of, uh, of the Internet of Things. Uh. So apparently the concept uh, was uh, first uh, mentioned by Kevin Ashton uh, from, from MIT in 1999. Uh, I still haven't found any trace of that, but uh, there is a sufficiently, uh, well, a, a sufficiently great number of people who, uh, who have heard this. But uh, uh, this Internet of Things uh, view back in 1999, it was very much uh, focused on using RFID tags uh, for supply chain management uh, purposes. Uh. Still, uh, we jumped on this uh, concept uh, in, uh, well, at that time, Helsinki University of Technology, and uh, I had this uh, dialogue uh, uh, team uh, there, uh, and we started developing uh, this kind of uh, Internet of Things uh, middleware that was also, surprise, surprise, called uh, Dialog. Uh, and what we did that back in 2001, well, we made an implementation uh, where you could uh, track uh, shipments uh, uh, going uh, all over the world. Uh, so uh, we were tracking, for instance, uh, deliveries of, uh, of uh, power plant uh, parts uh, going from different places in Finland to, uh, to the construction site in Chile and so on, and uh, following uh, where they were going. Uh, but okay, the thing to realize uh, back then was that uh, once you could identify any thing, you had some kind of identifier, an RFID tag or a barcode or anything else, that meant that you could also actually link the physical product to any information about it. Uh, so uh, if you had a maintenance person coming to, uh, to uh, some kind of machine that he had to service, then uh, he it was enough to just read uh, the identifier of that machine and get a link to all the information about that machine, what you should do about it, but you could also actually enter what you did uh, to the machine. Uh, and then the ne next step uh, was obviously to integrate logic or, or intelligence into the machine itself, so that it could start sending uh, sensor data and uh, events uh, uh, telling that uh, I'm going to break down in two weeks or so, if ever that machine had enough intelligence there. <coughs> okay, so, uh, and we also had these uh, funny scenarios of uh, putting the pizza into the microwave oven and, uh, and the pizza telling uh, uh, the microwave oven that uh, you should heat me for 30 seconds at 800 watts and, uh, and at the same time the microwave oven would check uh, if uh, it's uh, still eatable, this uh, pizza, or if it's uh, too old, and so on and so on. Uh. So uh, <coughs> this is okay, it's, it's, so it's sort of marketing uh, that uh, we did this uh, a long time ago, but it's uh, also to actually give some scope on the Internet of Things, as I said. Uh, so back in 2002, uh, we, I would claim that we uh, made a mo or did most of the scenarios, or implemented most of the scenarios uh, using that system back then. Uh, and uh, presumably you know what it nobody has contested the fact that we uh, probably have the first scientific uh, article mentioning the Internet of Things back in 2002. But uh, uh, an interesting uh, thing to know about uh, the Internet of Things might be that uh, we uh, sort of uh, uh, around 2004, uh, we it, se it seemed like the Internet of Things uh, was uh, going to stay limited to supply chain management, RFID tags, and so on, uh, and it didn't uh, really seem to take off. Uh, there was this uh, hype curve going up around 2001, but it started going down. 
we sort of uh, stopped uh, using the concept of uh, Internet of Things and started talking about intelligent products uh, instead uh, and uh, how you can embed uh, more and more intelligence into the products themselves so that they could control their life cycle data and what is happening to them uh, all over their life cycle. So uh, we were sort of uh, quite happy when uh, the Internet of Things uh, became very popular around uh, 2008 uh, or so. But before that, uh, we had some other concepts such as cyber physical systems uh, that uh, I don't remember who launched that around uh, 2008. Uh, I guess it was somebody else uh, who wasn't uh, happy about uh, the definition of the Internet of Things at that time. So they launched their own concept. Uh, then uh, the concept of industrial internet uh, was uh, uh, launched by Gen General Electric, I think, uh, around uh, 2012. And then we have seen uh, loads of other concepts uh, for the same thing also. So we have the Internet of Everything, Web of Things, Web of Anything, Web of All Things, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, and it seems like everybody wants to uh, sort of launch their own label for this uh, thing. But uh, to be honest uh, to me, uh, it's uh, still the same old Internet of Things. Uh. <coughs> uh, there's uh, a new concept also. Uh, I think Cisco has been very very uh, active in, in launching new concepts. Uh, so uh, recently there's been uh, the concept of fog computing, uh, which is about taking the Internet of Things to the edges or taking intelligence to the edges and not just uh, doing it on the cloud. Uh. But uh, to be honest, uh, that's not uh, new neither. That's uh, more or less the inter intelligent products uh, you do it. So that's uh, sort of an uh, looking back at the history of, of the Internet of Things uh, to, to give some uh, some scope uh, about uh, about what has been happening over the years. Now, still, uh, the Internet of Things uh, of today, uh, I would claim that uh, most people that I'm speaking about, about the Internet of Things, uh, they see it uh, as uh, something that looks like this. So we have, uh, this laser doesn't show uh, anything at all, we have uh, loads of different uh, sensors that are being installed uh, on different machines and uh, in different places. And then every sensor sort of uh, pushes data to its own uh, vertical silo, meaning uh, some kind of a specific application or, uh, or a specific cloud or, or something similar. Uh, and uh, as Ron said uh, earlier this morning, uh, even within uh, the same company, you might have uh, this uh, enterprise uh, data, whatever it was, uh, uh, but still uh, uh, in parallel with that system you have different departments uh, that actually develop their own uh, applications uh, for their own purposes. In the Internet of Things world uh, you see this happening all the time. Uh, you might have uh, ten, even 10 different sensors uh, installed in the same place measuring more or less the same data, and uh, uh, but still feeding just uh, different, uh, different applications. Uh. So that's uh, this uh, challenge of data being collected into vertical silos where they tend to become uh, isolated so that you can analyze only that specific data for that specific purpose uh, and uh, okay now I got a blackout <coughs> then the question is uh, if you just keep on pushing this uh, sensor data as most uh, applications do uh, let's say I take the temperature reading from this uh, room every 10 seconds for a few years. Well, the question is, uh, why would I do that and uh, what will I be doing with that uh, data and so on? Uh, I uh, quite often use uh, an example of, a, of an ele elevator in, in this case to, to explain for any kind of machine. Uh, uh, an elevator typically uh, works perfectly nearly 100% of the time, uh, but uh, I know some elevator manufacturers uh, who still keep on logging uh, data, let's say, uh, with a one minute interval uh, about uh, the, the elevator. But in practice, uh, that uh, data is not that interesting uh, to store or even analyze over time. What would be very interesting is uh, that uh, when the elevator breaks down, then you are extremely interested in, uh, in the data from the elevator for, let's say, the two uh, previous weeks or, or something like this. Uh. So there is definitely a uh, question of value, of data value. You shouldn't just be uh, collecting uh, data uh, blindly without knowing what you, you want to do with that. Uh, uh, it would be much uh, more useful if uh, you would actually uh, focus on the interesting events. Okay, you can't always know what are the interesting things to collect data about, but in the ideal case, 
you would be able to actually subscribe, uh, subscribe and get access to that data once you need it. Uh. So uh, <coughs> what I'm saying is that uh, the current uh, IoT uh, approach uh, actually has quite a few challenges. So this is not what we want to do. Uh, we don't want to just collect a huge amount uh, of uh, data and uh, then eventually uh, and hopefully somebody will uh, will find out uh, something uh, from that data. Uh, we have these uh, vertical silos where it's uh, really hard to get uh, in any kind of interoperability between the different uh, applications. And finally, uh, uh, the IoT requires communication between systems and organizations and systems. It's not just about machine-to-machine -machine communication. So, <coughs> uh, the thing that we are doing or working on uh, here at uh, the Open Group, uh, so uh, we have the Internet of Things uh, work group uh, whose goal is uh, really to develop uh, standards by which we could overcome the challenges uh, that we saw just a moment ago. Uh, so uh, we are speaking and thinking of, uh, of uh, systems uh, rather than sensors, all kinds of systems uh, where it uh, should be easy uh, to uh, access uh, information between different uh, platforms, different applications, different uh, devices, and so on. Uh, so if I have some kind of a system here, uh, let's say my sailing boat, uh, that would uh, get uh, need to get access to some uh, data about the weather forecast where I am just now, uh, then that should be a, a sort of uh, doable without any systems integra integration between my boat and the weather forecast uh, provider. And if uh, well, we'll see some uh, more examples of, of this kind of systems in a moment. Uh, so one point is also that IoT data, should you should be able to collect it as and when needed, uh, not just uh, push it uh, stupidly when, when you, well, uh, in just in the case that you might need it uh, sometime later. Now, uh, uh, Mariano, he also emphasized uh, the fact that uh, once you have all this data, uh, what you want to do with that is uh, it's eventually to analyze it somehow so that you can actually take some some action on that. Uh, but uh, in order to take some action, you might uh, need to have this kind of a feedback uh, loop also from the application in the cloud back uh, to the actual device and the actual user. And we'll see some uh, examples of that also in a moment. So. Uh <coughs> In uh, the Open Platform uh, 3 work, uh, we speak quite a lot about uh, systems of systems. Now, uh, it's uh, as you might have, uh, or as you saw in this uh, slide, uh, the point here is uh, really that any kind of system uh, should be able to speak with any other kind of system, no matter if it's, uh, if it's a smaller device, a sensor, or something else. So uh, that's uh, really why I have this slide here, uh, uh, because uh, the definition of what a system is, uh, in our point of view, it can be, uh, well, it can't be anything, uh, <laughs> but it uh, can be uh, a device or a service of, uh, of any size. Uh, so a system could be uh, an intelligent sensor, or a sensor as we see here. Uh, it could be just an RFID tag. You can't include that much intelligence into that, but you can actually make a, an Internet of Things a middleware system that uh, does represent uh, the product that the tag is, uh, is glued onto. Uh, then uh, we have uh, these, uh, well, a, a car that's uh, becoming a very intelligent system already by its own. But uh, as uh, you saw from these uh, previous examples that I had, uh, a car or a boat uh, might uh, need some access to uh, this uh, weather forecast system as well as uh, uh, access to this system, which, which might be a sensor telling uh, what is the road temperature just at the point where, where you are just now. Uh. Okay. <coughs> so, systems of systems. Now, uh, uh, one challenge uh, sometimes when I'm uh, speaking with the other Internet of Things people is that I notice that uh, at the, the Internet of Things work group here at the open group, uh, we have a slightly different view on what uh, the whole Internet of Things is about. Uh, for us, uh, the Internet of Things, uh, it's really about managing all the information about any product uh, or thing and over its whole uh, life cycle. So that means that uh, if I take, uh, I don't know, a car or anything else, I actually
actually have loads of information about that car being created even before the car exists. Uh, so I have uh, the, the, the plans, the designs and so on about it. Uh, I have uh, data about uh, how it was manufactured and once I start using it, once I actually have the, the product, the car or whatever, then it starts uh, creating its own uh, data. And uh, that means that uh, this information about the thing, it's uh, uh, typically distributed in over many si different systems, owned by many different organizations. So uh, that means that the actual physical thing and the data stored on that, it's uh, just a detail in this whole, uh, whole definition of, uh, of the Internet of Things. Uh, so uh <coughs> this is to illustrate that the Internet of Things in our view, it's a, a system that should provide you uh, well answers to questions such as uh, where do I have uh, all relevant information about my product? Is it in one or many places? And is it uh, specific to, uh, to my specific car, for instance? Or is it uh, some information that's found uh, in the manufacturer system about all the cars of, of this uh, brand and so on? So. The Internet of Things should really provide these uh, necessary capabilities for this kind of closed loop lifecycle management uh, where, where you can uh, sort of where you can find and update uh, information over the product's uh, whole life cycle. Now uh, to collect uh, or to connect uh, a little bit uh, closer to uh, the Open Platform 3, uh, in the Open Platform 3 work, uh, it's not just uh, about managing product life cycles, it's about uh, much more. Uh, so in the previous slide, uh, you saw these uh, red arrows here. Uh, uh, this uh, beamer is uh, really... Oh, laser is too bad. <laughs> you saw the red uh, links here. Uh, the red links uh, here, they are the standards that we are just now developing here uh, at the in the IoT workgroup and also related, of course, to the Open Platform 3.0. Uh, so it's really about uh, creating and enabling these, uh, all these red links uh, for all kinds of Internet of Things applications. So the applications that we have here, it's uh, not uh, just about managing the life cycle of some product. It's also about, for instance, when I come to a, a city, uh, drive, well, I drive into a city with my new electrical car, then uh, uh, then, then I might uh, want to get information about, uh, at least if it's in Finland, then about the temperature, are the roads uh, slippery or not, uh, uh, are there any bumps ahead, uh, uh, where can I get the, the car charged uh, if I'm limited in time and I have to find a parking place uh, somewhere. So uh, all these red links uh, here, they are the kinds of uh, information links to different systems that I would need to have in that kind of a scenario. So uh, <coughs> the standards and the Internet of Things uh, working group. Uh, now uh, the two first uh, standards that we uh, published, uh, they uh, they were called or they are called the Open Messaging Interface and the Open Data Format. And they were published uh, by the Open Group on uh, October 16th, uh, 2014. And uh, this uh, colorful thing here on the right, it's, uh, I don't know, think uh, you can see it in the back of the room, uh, unfortunately. But it uh, shows uh, where these uh, standards are located in, in some kind of a stack. But anyways, uh, the main functionality that these two standards uh, give to you, it's uh, new cap capabilities, it's that uh, when you have any kind of, uh, of product uh, or service or system uh, that pops up uh, somewhere, uh, then that system uh, needs to be able to publish uh, uh, what information and services uh, it can provide. Uh, so if I come in, in here, for instance, with a new printer, then that printer needs to be able to publish that it's uh, present here. Uh, you also need some functionality to discover uh, that uh, uh, for this room to discover that there's uh, now a new service, a new printer that I can uh, use. Uh, you need to be able to uh, query for information uh, and communicate with it with this uh, new service so that I can actually uh, uh, get or do something with it, meaning that I can print, uh, print on it uh, typically and so on. So, uh <coughs> no 
okay uh, at this moment uh, well I used to have these uh, examples uh, showing uh, what uh, what these uh, uh, what messages with this uh, these standards actually look like but uh, to be honest I'm not uh <coughs> let's say w once I get to to show some demos of actual systems that's uh, what I when I usually get uh, more much more enthusiastic about uh, presenting things uh, so um, apparently for some reason my laptop uh, didn't duplicate uh, this uh, user interface and uh, now the question is uh, to what extent uh, you can actually see uh, this uh, what's happening here so I'll try to increase the size a little bit okay so the point uh, here is that uh, I said that with these uh, standards uh, any service uh, can publish uh, uh, what information and uh, functionality you can access uh, from it now what you can see here it is uh, an imp a reference implementation that we are going to publish uh, with the uh, IoT Eclipse uh, uh, well in the con context of the Eclipse uh, mm, community and it's uh, IoT branch uh, and what you can see here it's uh, uh, a view of uh, what are the things or objects that are accessible at this specific URL so this uh, could be for instance uh, the service uh, at my home uh, where I can ask uh, which are all the objects uh, that I have uh, that I can uh, get access to from your home from my home or your home so uh, that means that this is the result uh, of a first uh, query that we have uh, done performed uh, using OMI and ODF so uh, I can then uh, go down, for instance, and uh, ask for the current information about, I don't know what they meant by consumption, CO2, humidity, light, and temperature in this case. So uh, then I generate the request. Uh, again, I guess you won't see a lot uh, about this, uh, a lot of this, uh, but uh, you have the examples also in, in the slides, or some examples. So what I can de define here or do here is that obviously I can ask for the immediate values of these uh, different things. So I had uh, uh, CO2 level, humidity, light and temperature. Uh, but what I can also do is that I can uh, define an interval here by which I can specify that I want to get this information uh, every 10 seconds or I might, w I might want to get this information every time that it changes. So uh, if I for instance put a subscription like this on the fire alarm in this place and then I would get a message only once the status of the fire alarm changes and uh, uh, with this time to live in that case I can define how long uh, this subscription should be uh, should be uh, valid so uh <coughs> well uh, okay I won't go more into detail about that now and then uh, well once I send this uh, then I will get uh, an answer that you most probably don't see here but I do get the the current values of uh, all the all the sensors that I that I asked for uh, as well as metadata about them now uh, uh, so this is uh, just to show what it looks like and the main logical steps so it's about the publishing information that you that uh, is available for you uh, how you can uh, discover that and how you can then make uh, queries, read, write, and so on, and especially how you can subscribe to different information for as long as you need it, and uh, with the resolution that you that you need or that you prefer. Uh, <coughs> now this is a sort of a geek tool. Uh, so I, I did warn you that I'm I'm sort of a computer scientist uh, who uh <coughs> who speaks uh, strangely in the in the corner and so on, uh, as Mariano said. Uh, but uh, we do uh, also have another implementation that's uh, being done for uh, not only for demo purposes but also for real uh, real production purposes uh, so what you can see here is a service uh, that we have uh, for one of the buildings at Dalto University and uh, we can get access to different uh, graphs and uh, 2D views and 3D views of, of this building but 
but uh, what uh, I'll show here and I'll rapidly it's uh, the 2D view so I have here a real-time view to different sensors in uh, the different rooms so I have uh, depending on what kind of sensor I have in what room I can of course see different information I can also uh, it's actually a heat map showing uh, the temperature in different rooms that I have here and uh, if I go into this uh, 360 degrees view I can check where I have a sensor installed and I actually have one installed uh, here as you can see in this place now the point here is that uh, we haven't done any programming whatsoever for integrating these sensors what you can do with the OMI and ODF is that uh, once you install your sensor somewhere in the building uh, that sensor will actually publish uh, its own uh, uh, information to my system so that it will show, show up exactly in the right place and, uh, and, and uh, show uh, the, the information that I can get from that specific uh, sensor now I haven't added th this uh, here yet but uh, you could of course uh, subscribe to this specific sensor and, uh, and some potential events uh, based on, on the values that you get from there and so on ok so back to the slides so that means that I can jump over these uh, slides and go to the key messages uh. now <coughs> Uh, as Alan said, uh, uh, we like to speak about OMI and ODF being the same for the Internet of Things as HTTP and HTML uh, are, uh, were and are still for, for the web. So that essentially means that you should be able to even compose and create new IoT systems or systems uh, without programming. Now uh, if you want to, uh, let's go back to the web uh, parad paradigm again. Now what was a uh, uh, sort of new and rev revolutionary I think about uh, the web uh, was that anybody could publish uh, some kind of well a new web page uh, telling whatever you wanted to publish to, to anybody else uh, and you only needed to find a web server that could host your page and then it was automatically published uh, to anybody who, who wanted to read it and then it also became accessible for search engines and so on so if you wanted to to publish uh, well any kind of information you didn't need to set up uh, how was it a two months uh, development uh, project uh, first to do it with uh, scrum and agile and, and so on as uh, Ron mentioned this uh, this morning I think it was Ron uh, you just uh, well go ahead and do it now my point here is that what you saw just a moment ago using OMI and ODF it's that you can do exactly the same thing also with or your things can do the same thing uh, meaning that uh, you can just put them there tell them to publish uh, the information that they have and allow uh, that to be integrated into any other systems uh, and even be discoverable by search engines and so on so this is all about uh, keeping it simple and, uh, and so on uh, now maybe I should, should have spent uh, or saved more time for this slide because this is really the key message uh, it said that with these standards you can take down a system integration system interoperability uh, uh, creation from a few months of integration work uh, to uh, a few seconds of, uh, of just uh, querying, querying and subscribing to information when and as you need it now <coughs> the logical next uh, question uh, after that is that uh, okay great I can publish anything to anybody but uh, then what uh, what about uh, security and privacy and so on uh, now uh, uh, this is uh, an article that was posted on the open platform uh, discussion forum uh, some weeks ago and it's quite a typical uh, title that you can see here so uh, the internet blah 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 the I'll read this in case you don't see it in the back of the, of the room then again I think you have screens there the internet of stuff is a gigantic ultra poor robbery network study <coughs> now and then IoT devices uh, facilitate robbery stalking and cyber crime and so on uh, now uh, uh, when I <coughs> it sort of makes me laugh and not laugh when I when I see this kind of, uh, of articles uh, uh, it is true that uh, for the moment uh, you have many systems uh, all kinds of embedded 
embedded systems especially, that uh, different uh, backstores, companies and so on just uh, connect to the internet uh, uh, using uh, the, the old uh, standards uh, and bus uh, protocols and so on that, uh, that they have been, been using uh, for ages. But they uh, are quite often uh, put there without any, any encryption, ac access control uh, and so on. But uh, uh, let's say that accusing the Internet of Things uh, for, for being the, the bad guy there, that's not really being fair. Because uh, uh, what the companies are doing, or what, what this article is about, uh, it's uh, that, uh, that people uh, who have sensors and all kinds of embedded systems, uh, they, don't just, uh, they simply don't care about security. Uh, it doesn't change the fact, uh, if you call it uh, the Internet of Things or something else, uh, you would still have the same uh, security challenges there. But uh, <coughs> uh, it is definitely a new enterprise architecture challenge uh, with all these systems, uh, because uh, uh, as you have seen uh, also in the previous presentations today, uh, the Internet of Things uh, requires communication with systems of numerous other organizations. So uh, for instance, uh, okay, let's go back to the vehicle uh, example. Uh, a service shop uh, that uh, does servicing for uh, tens of different uh, vehicles or tens of different uh, brands, well, they might have to, in, uh, to interoperate with the, the maintenance systems of all those vehicle manufacturers. So, uh, <coughs> so the big uh, change for enterprise architects is definitely that in the past it might have been enough to just interoperate with systems of other organizations, but now, uh, in addition to this, uh, you might your systems might have to interoperate with devices, systems and products uh, coming from loads of different organizations. So this really changes the challenge and uh, makes it much, uh, much bigger. One technological challenge uh, that we have is uh, that the current uh, public key infrastructure, PKI, will not scale at all to billions of uh, devices. Uh, I just claim this. Uh, we'll ha have a discussion about this, uh, I guess, with the security forum also. But all this, uh, I, I would say that it's uh, not uh, a threat in any way. I'd rather see this as an opportunity for, uh, for the open group uh, because uh, there are interesting things to, to be done. We have some ideas about uh, how we should be doing it, and, and I think uh, it's uh, not such a bad uh, situation in that sense. Now I need to check uh, the time. Uh, <coughs> everybody is getting hungry quite soon. Uh, just to give a give sort of a, an impression of what this uh, looks like in reality with the real systems uh, that we have uh, currently, I'll go through some uh, some applications that we have uh, developed uh, over the years, and especially uh, this one. So. Uh, uh, I'm also the CEO of a company called uh, Control Things, uh, and uh, Control Things is developing IoT systems uh, for well, any kind of, uh, of IoT products and so on. And uh, especially, we are focusing on smart houses and smart equipment uh, within houses. Uh, so, uh, what I'm going to show us the, the first uh, demonstration here is this uh, system that we have made for. A manufacturer of this kind of, of machines. Uh, so this is a ventilation machine or air handling unit uh, that's located in our ho house in in uh, Finland. And uh, what is new about uh, this kind of equipment uh, is that uh, nowadays, uh, as soon as uh, you well, this is a product that has been out for a over a year already. So here you see the manufacturer's logos and so on. But the point here and the main reason why I'm showing this system is that once uh, this machine is uh, installed in your house and you switch on the power for the first time, if you have an internet cable uh, connected to the machine, then you will get access to this user interface uh, directly from your smartphone, uh, any browser and so on. So what we have here is that uh, the machine uh, tells you, of course, what, I what is its uh, serial number, as well as a PIN code. Uh, so that means that now that I now when I click on login uh, here, <coughs> the browser will establish an SSL secured connection from the browser all the way to the machine back in Finland. So this is a, a real-time connection to, uh, to the machine that looks uh, as you saw in the picture in the house that actually also looks uh, like, uh, like in the pre 
big picture that I had just a moment ago. So here, uh, <coughs> what I can see, it's uh, uh, HRC, this is a temperature and so on, but uh, what is uh, more interesting uh, to see is maybe the measurements uh, that I can get from the machine. Uh, so it has been logging uh, different uh, temperatures from uh, uh, from from uh, the surroundings, uh, such as the outside air, uh, supply air uh, to the heat recovery uh, unit, uh, supply air to the to the house, and so on. And the point here is that uh, this machine actually has all these sensors uh, already for its own control purposes. Uh, so uh, there's no additional cost of having all this. Uh, now what is quite interesting, uh, especially for the manufacturer, uh, who can of course collect all this information from all the machines, if, I, if uh, the owners allow them to, what's interesting to check here is for instance how well this machine is performing, meaning how much heat does it recover on the way, on the incoming air, compared to uh, how much it recovers as heat from the outgoing air. Uh, now, uh, a technical detail here is that I know, uh, because I know these machines, that this number here should be higher than this number here. If uh, it's the other way around, uh, it means that uh, there will be overpressure in the house, and at least in Finland that means that uh, I'll get humidity into the walls, and the whole house will probably rot away in a few uh, years, or at least uh, we'll have some health problems from, from having humidity in the walls. Uh. So this is a sort of... A the kind of data that you uh, you can uh, that the machine could uh, check by itself uh, if uh, something is going wrong. Reasons for that uh, could be, uh, for instance, that uh, I haven't changed the filters in the, in the machine for ages. Uh, I might have a fan breaking down or that has broken down, which actually happened uh, last year in Amsterdam when I was presenting. Then I noticed that uh, there's something wrong when I was showing this demo and. Uh, uh, yeah, it was uh, actually one of the fans uh, which uh, was uh, broken. So what I can do also is uh, that I can uh, control the machine in real time uh, from here. So uh, I just put on over pressure into the house. Uh, uh, they're sort of used uh, to, uh, to the having the machine doing strange kinds of things. So uh, that's what happened uh, just now. Uh, over pressure is something that I need when I put uh, fire to my fireplace because uh, with under pressure I would otherwise get all the all the fumes uh, inside. And uh, if anybody uh, doesn't believe, uh, then, uh, uh, well, <coughs> normally these measurements uh, should, uh, okay, I didn't have it on uh, long enough, uh, but these uh, measurements uh, will go uh, the other way around uh, in a moment. Uh. So the point here is that uh, with this kind of a system, the equipment manufacturer and maintenance company, they can follow what's happening uh, uh, with all the machines, collect loads of data on it, uh, on them, analyze it, uh, come up with uh, better control uh, strategies and so on, and uh, then also feed that back to the machines uh, and control them remotely. We are doing this all the time. Uh, now, uh, I, as usual, I was a little bit too slow in the beginning, and uh, now that I get to the fun parts, uh, I'm probably running out of time. Uh, one thing that I keep on, that I usually uh, show, uh, also, it's uh, the CO2 uh, uh, level that we have actually in our bedroom and in our son's bedroom. The reason why we have these uh, is that the machine actually keeps uh, the CO2 level or tries to keep that uh, below 1000 ppm. Uh, so uh, that's why we have the sensors. But ob obviously, um <coughs> yeah. I can also see other interesting things, especially when I'm traveling, uh, such as that, uh, well, I know from this uh, from this graph I can see that our daughter got, got up at 6 o'clock in the morning as usual to go to, to go to school and my wife got up at uh, I think it was 11 o'clock or something like that uh, <laughs> and uh, some other things uh, that I can see. Uh, this is our son's bedroom so he apparently had his girlfriend uh, with him tonight and, <laughs> and so on. <coughs> okay so oh, may, uh, I should switch off the over pressure here. Uh, so uh, that's just to show how important it is with obviously privacy and security. Uh, I wouldn't like to have anybody else uh, else looking at these. Uh, uh, okay, I also have this other system. It's uh, the total uh, electricity consumption in the house uh, where you can see what's happening with the six uh, second uh, precision and, and so on. Uh, 
So these are just to show uh, different kinds of systems. From this, these graphs uh, actually can control most of the systems in the house, but I won't go into that. But as uh, you saw from these uh, applications, uh, uh, you really need to have a secured connection uh, with, uh, with these services. And here you can see a sort of an interesting detail that uh, this system, it's run by our company, but uh, uh, we should probably update the certificates here uh, because uh, the standard PKI doesn't, uh, doesn't want to accept uh, this anymore. Uh, now, just a quick word about that, uh, it, that uh, uh, certificate management will be a nightmare in the Internet of Things if, if we don't come up with something uh, new there. So, <coughs> I won't go through all the other applications. We have also done uh, vehicle fleet management uh, with the by connecting this kind of vehicles uh, for service and maintenance purposes and so on to, to the Internet. Uh, at the Helsinki Vanta Airport, they had this real-time view the different vehicles uh, up and running for for uh, nearly two years. Uh, uh, we have also uh, installed the OMI and ODF compliant uh, implementations to the Volkswagen factories where different people can subscribe to different data depending on what they are doing and for as long as uh, they are doing it and uh, also uh, potentially perform control actions uh, to the manufacturing uh, of these uh, plate parts of of uh, the Volkswagen cars. And uh, <coughs> uh, these are some other applications uh, that have or implementations uh, done by other companies in the Internet of Things uh, work group, namely Holonix. Uh, the next uh, standard that we are planning to publish is the Open Lifecycle Management uh, Standard, which uh, is a vocabulary for product lifecycle management. So uh, this is again about uh, well wind turbine gearboxes uh, uh, and trucks. Uh, this is for the building industry, uh, so dams and so on, furniture manufacturing, and so on and so on. Now uh <coughs> all these applications uh, uh, were just some of the examples of use cases that we have identified within the Open Platform 3 work. Uh, so I repeat that the OMI and ODF uh, it's, uh, and uh, the other standards, it's really about enabling all these red links uh, here to be established even without programming. And uh, for the kinds of applications that you can see here, if you are very good at reading, uh, so uh, vehicle driver usage uh, analytics, uh, customer preferences and behavior analytics and, and so on. Uh, okay, I won't go through this slide because I'm, I think I'm running out of time. But this kind of applications, you saw that we have, there are some existing uh, commercial ones already, but we still have the challenge of, uh, of making the creation of them uh, more, well, quicker and, uh, and without requiring these months of systems integration. So, uh, I sort of like this uh, picture that, uh, well, we all know the challenge with the languages, uh, money, and uh, so on. Or you saw the, the guy in Germany who, uh, who, who was uh, thinking a lot, and I know about French people who are always angry when uh, before lunch, and I guess you might be that uh, quite soon also. My wife is French, yeah, so uh, <coughs> I know, they, well, it, the difference between angry and hungry is, uh, tends to be challenging. But uh, with uh, the Internet of Things, uh, if we don't have uh, this kind of standard, such as the o ODF and o um, OMI, it will be a nightmare, or we simply won't get the productivity uh, uh, gains and uh, the, the business uh, models that we would like to get out of it, uh, or the business that we want. Now, <coughs> finally, the message to uh, maybe enterprise architects uh, in particular, uh, it's that uh, with the Internet of Things uh, and, and these systems of systems, the number of organizations that you need to interoperate with may grow enormously uh, compared to what it uh, used to be uh, in the past. And uh, we should, uh, should, should also uh, think about this uh, time scale of the interoperability in the sense that uh, you might have to be able to interoperate uh, with, uh, let's say, a vehicle that comes into one of your maintenance garages uh, for the first time, so you need to get access to that information, discuss with, the, with that vehicle for, let's say, half an hour, and then it disappears and you will never see a vehicle like that again. But if you, if you are not able to interoperate with the manufacturer's uh, information system and po 
possibly other maintenance systems and so on, then you can't do it properly. Now, that obviously means uh, new challenges for security and privacy. We speak quite a lot about trust-based uh, security uh, as an alternative to, uh, to the PKI uh, uh, systems. So that's uh, one of the things that I think we'll be working very actively on in the open group. And finally, IoT is really about systems of systems rather than machine to machine. And uh, then the final work, uh, word uh, is that, uh, well, for enterprise architects, uh, I definitely don't think, uh, well, it's a challenge uh, to, uh, to uh, take with the Internet of Things. But uh, at least uh, I sort of like uh, taking on new challenges uh, quite a lot. So I think that for enterprise architects, uh, we should really take this as a tremendous opportunity to, uh, to uh, well, well, make us uh, necessary again, if we, in case we became unnecessary at some moment, and, uh, and actually uh, do something much more fun again, not just uh, pushing the screen off uh, the table and so on. So, thank you. It shows zero minutes here. Thank you. So we've got a few minutes before people get angry or hungry. So um, to ask the questions, um, I'll reintroduce Dave Bounds, BDO Proof CTO. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Kerry. It's what a what an exciting area this is. You know, we've seen that explosion in the devices and the sensors, and now the actuators, uh, even as you demonstrated. Uh, your, your family must be very tolerant. You know, you, the, you go to these conferences, and all of a sudden the heat starts going on and off, and the fans <laughs> going on and off in your house. We won't even get into the thing about the bedrooms, but um, which we have a question on later. But so I'm going to start with two uh, somewhat related questions. Uh, one of which is: uh, Is the IoT work group uh, planning or conducting outreach and harmonization efforts with other IoT standards bodies or bodies that are promoting um, the uh, use of the Internet of Things? Uh, yes, we are, of course, uh, to the extent. Uh, that it's possible. Uh, there is uh, an, an initiative of pushing uh, the OMI and ODF towards uh, ISO, but I guess the question is uh, more about that uh, there are, uh, well, all standards organizations have some kind of IoT standardization activity ongoing. Uh, of course, we are following uh, what is happening there very closely, but uh, what I can see is that uh, what is being standardized, it's uh, very much the machine-to-machine -machine level, uh, and uh, it's uh, I haven't seen any real initiative uh, for this uh, systems to systems uh, level uh, interoperability, but we are following. Uh, if somebody is doing it, then yep. I know uh, the open group always uh, does liaison with other organizations. One of the strongest liaisons we have is with um, uh, the uh, um, the uh, indu industrial internet consortium, and uh, through our relationship with the OMG, and there again. Not so much about standards, but driving adoption. I know we've got some people in the audience who are interested in that. So we should make sure those get connected. Uh, you mentioned uh, the, at the beginning, we talked about the, uh, the silos of all these sensors. Um, and how are these legacy systems going to be brought along? You know, they're going to they're be in our houses. You know, we've got the Nest thermostats or whatever, um, or your system. So how do those get brought into, the, uh, into this ecosystem? Sorry, could you say the last part again? H how, do, how do these legacy sensors who are, have their own silos of data and their own silos of control mechanism get brought into this uh, uh, IoT vision? Yeah, well, uh, the way that we have done it is, uh, of course, I'm promoting that they should uh, just add an OMI and ODF compliant layer on it. Uh, uh, that's more or less what, what we have been doing. Uh, actually, the vertical si silos, uh, they typically don't want to publish uh, all their information anyways. Uh, so uh, for the imp information that they do actually want to share with somebody else, uh, uh, that's usually done uh, by uh, an a REST API. And what most companies do then is that they, uh, okay, they publish uh, something automatically, a REST API, and then they say tell the others that, uh, well, just take this and uh, you get access to it. Uh, OMI and ODF, it's uh, just a standardized and well-documented way of uh, doing that. And uh, it doesn't take that much effort, uh, to be honest. That's why why we are also working on this reference implementation, so that uh, all companies uh, could get it even off the shelf. Uh, so uh, it's not a big uh, implementation work. Uh, so okay. you gave a couple of examples of adoption of um, OMI and ODF uh, in your in your talk, uh, you know, Volkswagen and the uh, the wind turbines. Are there any 
other uh, examples you can give of adoption and any feel for whether the standards being taken up in the market, what, what the adoption rate is? Well, that's the tricky question. It's uh, The standards uh, were officially published only in October uh, last year. So uh, that means that there hasn't been that much uh, time to, uh, to take that up. Uh, uh, I think that's really the main challenge. Uh, and uh, I, I hope uh, the open group and this uh, presentation here and uh, will help in, in getting a more widespread. Yes, Sorry, I don't have a better answer. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it is, you know, one of the, uh, in fact, I, I saw, uh, I have to say, uh, on your slides you used an, an old logo which had a tagline which uh, said uh, making standards work. And we always have to remind ourselves that uh, creating the standard is just the beginning and it's the adoption that, that, that makes it actually have value in the marketplace. So last question, um, you know, you talked about the ODA and ODI publishing uh, the information of uh, sensors and of course uh, you showed examples of actuators. Um, you know, can you say a little bit more about how you see the, the security of those uh, evolving so that we, you know, that we don't, don't have accidental exposure of who's in, in what room in your house? Uh, yeah, as I said, we, uh, we have integrated uh, a whole stack, uh, SSL stack, into the control board of, of those machines, which was a sort of a challenge. Uh, but I, I see, I know about many projects and uh, companies uh, who are developing uh, uh, new uh, hardware, sensor hardware, and so on, where you have this uh, these security features uh, integrated already. But uh, what still remains uh, to be done is uh, how you actually uh, give all these different devices uh, unique identity, meaning certificates or public and private keys, and, and so on. I think there we we really will have a challenge. Okay, great. Well, that's it. Thank you very much, Carrie. Thank you.